Hey everybody, welcome to this Friday Science Podcast. Let's jump right in with a new analysis of data to understand what actually does cause autism. The words gene-environment interaction has sometimes been used to express the idea of we really don't know what it is, we don't know the right gene, there could be multiple environmental factors that we didn't really measure. As I mentioned in the 2014 year-end summary, a study from USC identified a specific mutation and a specific environmental factor that increase the risk for autism. But as we know, autism is complex. The interaction may not show up on the diagnosis itself, but in the symptoms of autism. This really hasn't been studied very well, but I'm happy to report a new study this week using the Simon Simplex collection has addressed the question. The genetics were all pulled into a type of mutation called copy number variations, which have already been associated with autism. The group looked at autism severity and autism diagnosis in almost 2,000 individuals with autism, those with and without CNVs and those with and without a history of maternal infection, or both. The simplex collection of those families with only one family member affected, and the rate of these copy number variations have been shown to be different compared to what is known as multiplex, or families with more than one affected sibling, like two brothers. I'm just mentioning this because these sorts of interactions may not be able to be replicated in every study exactly. But what's important is that it was documented once. So what did they find? Not looking at diagnosis, but looking at symptoms, this group of researchers led by Raphael Bernier at UW found strong evidence supporting the interaction between genetic susceptibility as defined by the presence of autism spectrum disordered associated copy number variants or CNVs and environmental insults in the form of maternal infection or fever during pregnancy. Individuals with the CNV and prenatal history of maternal infection or illness showed greater autistic severity than children with either risk factor alone or neither risk factor. There was no interaction on cognitive or adaptive functioning. This was just for autism severity. The pattern was reflected against all domains of autism impairment and resulted in clinically relevant changes in behavioral outcomes. For instance, in the case of the social responsiveness scale, the highest scores indicating severe symptoms were found mostly in individuals with a history of maternal illness and the presence of CNVs, but not with those with one or the other. The results were not organized by male and female, which was somewhat disappointing, but the bottom line here is that looking in isolation at genes or environmental factors are not going to be nearly as informative as looking at both factors together. And it's really a good thing that this collection was gathering information about environmental risk factors, or this type of analysis could have never been done. As far as the specific environmental factor involved of maternal illness and infection, some infections can't be avoided. Nobody really wants to be sick during their pregnancy, but there are things you can do to avoid it. For example, getting vaccinated against the flu. Also, wash your hands and most importantly, stay away from contagious sick people. Speaking of separating out severity of autism and adaptive functioning and the differences in the symptoms of autism, we can all agree this has been very hard. The symptoms are very complex. We don't know how much the domains of severity and adaptive functioning really overlap, how symptoms and functioning early on in life affect those down the road. Symptoms are different in each individual, and they also change over time. Change over time is actually the hardest thing to look at because there are very few studies that have been able to track people with autism across time. One of these studies is the High Risk Baby Sibs Research Consortium, which follows infants around six months of age until diagnosis around age three. But what after diagnosis? What happens then? The type of studies I'm talking about called longitudinal studies are really essential to understand autism. How someone starts out does not mean how they will end up. There are many factors at work that can improve functioning or lead to better outcomes. Recently, one of the longitudinal studies that examined this effect was published out of Canada. It was done by one of the world's leading experts in autism, Dr. Peter Zatmari. Their group followed over 400 kids with autism from age 2 to 3 to age 6 and studied how they developed along the way. So think of it as a starting line and a finish line with pit stops. They looked at both autism symptom severity and adaptive functioning, but analyzed them separately. They wanted to see how much autism symptom severity and adaptive functioning overlapped. Based on the patterns across the three years, 
the people in the study clustered into groups. Because the study is actually open access, I'm not going to get into every details, but I will post the link to the study on our Facebook page. In summary, with regard to severity, most of the kids were on the more severe end and their symptoms were stable. However, about 11% actually showed an improvement of symptoms over time. On the other hand, about 20% of the kids in the study showed improvements in adaptive behaviors. Most importantly, they found that there was a lot of cross-membership in each group. Therefore, the commonly held notion of higher functioning and lower functioning types of autism being the same as saying less severe and more severe autism symptoms was not really supported. Although there's certainly a link between a child's autism severity and their adaptive functioning at any given point, studying children at multiple points over time suggests that this association is really much more complex. And because I always have to ask about sex differences, the results of the analyses of risk factors showed that the sex of the child led to difference in trajectory. For example, boys were more likely to show more severe symptoms and a stable trajectory than girls who were more likely to show less severe symptoms and an improving trajectory. Lots of data here, but what was really the point? Now we have documented data that shows that autism severity and adaptive functioning can be independent from each other, and that symptoms at age two do predict symptoms at age six in most cases. So it is important to go even earlier so that we can influence the starting line for individuals with autism. Finally, I want to tell you about a study that ran before Christmas of last year, but in light of all the recent attention on the source of information that leads to healthcare behaviors like vaccination, I thought it was relevant and pertinent for this week. A Canadian study analyzed the recommendations given by two U.S.-based talk shows with somewhat of a pseudo-medical basis. Researchers watched episodes of the Dr. Oz show and the show The Doctors, and then researched the medical recommendations made by both of these shows to determine whether or not they had any evidence base. They also analyzed what type of recommendations were typically given or whether or not it, fo it followed or contradicted existing scientific knowledge. They found that in the case of the Dr. Oz show, his recommendations and statements were only backed up by evidence about 46% of the time. For the show The Doctors, it was about 63% of the time. Both shows gave advice that contradicted scientific evidence about 15% of the time. Most of what Dr. Oz said had to do with dietary advice, and almost never did either show disclose that they had a conflict of interest. The public should really be skeptical of both these medical quote-unquote talk shows, and really they should only be used for entertainment purposes. Thank you all for listening this week. Also, I want to thank all the families, advocates, scientists, and doctors who have been so generous with their time, their tweets, their interviews around the important issue of vaccinating your child against deadly diseases and using science-based, replicated, and validated evidence to guide medical decisions. Thank you, everyone, and I will talk to you next week.